Hello, phantoms and banshees. Welcome to the Mania Podcast. I have recently decided that I will be saving any news relevant to the show for the end of the episode, so if you want to learn about merchandise, giveaways, or anything else that I feel is worth telling my audience, that is where you can go from here on out to find all that. It will be an entirely new section called Crypt Cleaning. And now, without further delay... The Hunchback of Notre Dame is a story written by the much-celebrated writer Victor Hugo. Considering the recent events of the Cathedral Fire, I thought it appropriate to construct an episode that would pay homage to the monument that was damaged. More broadly, to take a moment in reflecting on the immediate vicinity by which we exist next to history, and yet how threadbare our connection to it can be. A single accident, a small flame gone unnoticed, the conflagration which consumed the spire of Notre Dame didn't take the entire structure with it, but one can imagine a scenario where it very well did. It is up to us, and only us, to carefully tread around the artifacts of our ancestors, if we are to preserve them. Books, buildings, art, and all manner of creation all contain a soul, a soul consisting of the artist who made them, and more importantly, of those who observed their nature and felt a spark, a connection. It is important to preserve these souls, as our relationship with them is synchronistic. If we take care of the past, of the rich cultures and art contained therein, the past will continue to feed us, inspire us, direct us, remind us of both the blessings and curses hidden in human nature. It was a winter's day in 1820 that bit at Victor Hugo as he left his home in the 6th arrondissement of Paris. His abode was near the Cathedral of Notre Dame. At the time, though it still boasted its iconic double towers, its frame and even insides were battered throughout. In July of 1801, Napoleon Bonaparte signed an agreement to restore the cathedral, but it was no small project, and in Victor's day, its overall health still appeared to be declining. The characteristic strix, gargoyles, and demonic visages which appear throughout the cathedral were also non-existent at this time. It would be in part due to Victor Hugo himself that these details and many others were added, as he was deeply passionate about the Gothic architectural traditions which were originally instilled into the structure. And although there were architects looking to change it, he was championing the cause of attaining politicians, architects, and craftsmen who would seek to sustain its legacy rather than alter it. And that's precisely what was on his mind as he was crossing the Pont Neuf Bridge. Despite the length of the bridge, he took his time, hands deep in his pockets and head bent forward. The wind continued to crash against the walls of the bridge and gust upwards, casting Victor's coat about. The passers-by were mere shadows in his periphery, the details of their expressions blurred by his own conjurations, stories fluttering around in his head, like the first swirls of snow now fluttering around him. Only days before, Victor's mother had passed. As his eyes swept up and over the Sien River, he found his thoughts irrevocably lost to ideas beyond his present circumstance. It was a confusing time. His mother represented both an irreplaceable connection, but also a barrier She never approved of Victor's childhood love and now fiancé. That's why he waited for his mother to pass before he would marry her. There was a bittersweetness in her passing, the bizarre concoction of elation for his coming marriage, but the subsequent grief was numbing. The young Victor, whose black straight hair bordered his cheeks, became somewhat disheveled the longer the wind whipped at him, so he first sought refuge in a favorite haunt of his, Café Prokop. As Victor walked in, he was assaulted by the exotic aroma of coffee, caramelized sugar, and rising dough. The steam from various brewing methods collected and were cramped in the space, where there was little to any ventilation, as this was preferable 
to winter having its way inside. The charming liveried interior matched the attire of a server who bumped into Victor with a tray of delicate pastries, jostling a tea kettle that sloshed as he was issued a mumbled apology before the servant swept off. Victor made himself comfortable at an empty table. He gently massaged his head as he flipped to an empty page in his journal. The clamor and bustle, the tinkling of porcelain, and occasional dropping of dishes in the kitchen was somewhat tranquil. Conversations rose, forced out from their quiet murmurs from the sheer volume of people inside. Yet this was better than the silence outside. The low and steady hissing of wind in his ears, interrupted only by the clatter of carriages and hooves. Before long, another servant brought over Victor's usual fixings. He gave a firm nod, already engrossed in his reflection. Having visited the cafe for nearly every day out of the past year, Victor's quiet presence was tantamount to requesting an order. But it wasn't just the heat from the kitchens, the smoldering condensation from all the coffee brewing. The cafe's air was stuffed from the ghosts of giants before him, fragments of their memories, their inspirations, bearing down on him. Where any young man walks, someone better has gone before him. And for a young writer such as Victor, this atmosphere was precisely what simultaneously burdened and yet attracted him, drew him in. The likes of philosophers, revolutionaries, poets, and authors had frequented the cafe since its inception in 1686, notably Voltaire himself, whose writings even then were influencing Victor's continually strained path from the Catholic teachings that he was raised with, and so he did what many writers had done before him. He spent hours writing a furious load of thoughts which, though seeming ponderous with philosophical weight, also felt utterly vacuous at the same time rendered to feel hollow by the bare intuition of life's truths as felt by thought alone, without any attempt at recording. Hours later, with the cafe empty, Victor fell back into his chair. The eighth cup of coffee lost to him, he stared off with a vacancy to his eyes. Caffeine had little effect anymore, and as his practice with honing his style stretched longer, his temper grew shorter. It seemed he squeezed out the excess and innards of his soul in the very same place where so many others had done before him. Only what Victor was left with was this inane exhaustion. The young writer left the cafe, warmed by the liquor he'd finished his meal with, but the alcohol too had little effect. His senses were already dulled by the deluge. It felt like a bloodletting, and in vain. How many poems have I written? Victor wondered. How many stanzas have gone unread? Before he could think better, he'd cursed loudly, albeit with a tipsy slur, sending a piece of trash into the Cien. As it was past midnight, the only light remaining in the city fell from gas lamps. Thick amber warmth spilled from their frosted panes, their glow dissembled itself upon the snowy paths. Victor's shadow was puppeteered along the walkways, smoldering with all his youthful impatience, naivety, and misused intellect. But near his apartment, Victor spotted the atelier whose windows still emitted a bright glow. And what's more, noise was coming from it. It was a constant, high, ringing sound, like a miner tapping on a vein with a pickaxe over and over again. He'd been awoken by the sound before, having lived next to that specific atelier. Carvers, stonemasons, and sculptors often worked from this shop, hired by the city or architects for various buildings. Victor looked about, even examined his hand briefly to make certain he wasn't dreaming. Then he continued towards the atelier, the only abode on the entire street that wasn't asleep. He stopped himself. Was it strange to approach the sculptors and carvers working at 2 a.m., rude to interrupt their work? Or were they being rude? Victor swayed, hiding next to the doorway. Fueled by the courage of Amaretto, the writer put on his best sober expression and pushed through the door into the shop. What he saw was a worker, his back bent over his work in stern discipline, chisel in hand and hammer in the other, gray powder sprayed out in little bursts onto the ground, littered with the same substance. Victor minded his feet as he got closer. Then he realized the worker wasn't just bending over the sculpture, but his back was crooked. This happened, bent into a hooked shape of a snake having just been clattered over a dozen times on a walkway. Before Victor could excuse himself quietly, the carver twisted his head around, perhaps sensing a shift in the room. So the writer and the worker stared at each other 
equally perplexed and at a loss as to how to revive any sense of normality in a situation that was utterly abnormal. Victor, stammering to compose himself, now finding that the hunchback's face was as distorted as his spine, fiddled with the bindings of his journal. His jaw was slack, and he moved his face as if to begin a remark or apology, but no sound issued. The carver, taking in a familiar expression of surprise, repulsion, and perhaps remorse for having had curiosity, resisted his normal instincts. Normally, the hunchback would grunt and return to his work, waiting for silence to do his part and shoo away the nuisance that is something beautiful looking upon the horrific. It was the late hour, the odd circumstance, maybe even the low courage of Victor to stumble into the shop at all at such an hour. Then there was the writer's brows and eyes. After the initial shock of the hunchback's drooping eye, the mouth that was several inches misplaced off its mark, and the contorted teeth sticking through his thick lips, Victor composed his rudeness. He apologized, and with all the elegance an unknown poet can have at 2 a.m. after too much liquor, he extended his hand and greeted the stonemason. They exchanged names. The hunchback, having introduced himself as Monsieur Dacion, offered Victor a seat. The two exchanged basic details of their day, their night, what led each of them to this moment, short, finite narratives that revealed more about their entire lives than any formal introduction might do. It was the burning question that kept the conversation moving while the hunchback toiled away. Why? Victor wondered. Was he working at such a god's forsaken hour, and why hadn't the city police forbid him against it due to the noise? The hunchback was carving out the face of a gargoyle, whose likeness, Victor realized unkindly, was more pleasant to look at than its creator. A comparison he wasn't altogether happy to conclude naturally. But the answer to Victor's question was simple. Several of the best sculptors in the city had been paid to provide samples of their work, what would be replicated and produced for the Notre Dame Cathedral. More interestingly, there was a bidding of sorts for which style, a competition, a showing that would be judged and decided upon. At this point, the Monsieur Dacion went on a long tirade about the more contemporary styles being offered by other carvers and other ateliers throughout the city, and how their influence would spoil the old elegance of Notre Dame. Having seen the cathedral at its present state, Victor was perplexed. Besides its size and double bell towers, the cathedral was lacking elegance, if any elegance, it once had from its better medieval days. Now it appeared little else than the dwelling for dead, bored priests, and the occasional worshipper stuck in limbo with no better place to haunt. It made for a romantic, gothic setting, what with all the crows, nests, and whatnot. And that's when it struck Victor as admirable. There were almost a dozen completed statues of Strix, gargoyles, gnashing visages and other deformed creatures staring about the room. Some even had dried blood spotting their features, as the hunchback's hands were heavily bandaged, and what bare flesh showed was covered in all manner of calluses and scars. Victor half expected the hunchback's fingers to feel tougher than the materials they were working with. Not that he was keen on touching them again, one handshake was more than enough for sure. No, but what Victor found admirable was how fitting it truly was. The cathedral was a creation of a more medieval soul. Its dark, deteriorating walls and crumbling complexity spoke of days with longer shadows. Though it dwelled in modern times, had stood through the winds of the Renaissance, the Crusades, the Hundred Years' War, and suffered heavily during the French Revolution in 1790, it still wasn't a modern building just for having survived all that time. Thusly, its soul was not contemporary by any stretch. Its soul was as hideous as happened and horribly beautiful as the creatures being birthed from the hunchback's imagination. And though Victor had not seen the other sculptures, had not witnessed the other craftsmen at their labor, he concluded that the hunchback, carving away at the dead hours of morning, was the inspiration the cathedral's renovation needed. More importantly, it was what his career as a writer needed. If his stories, his poetry, his articles in the newspaper championed the gothic style that the Notre Dame would be graced with, should Dacian's style be chosen, his fame would be uplifted in parallel with the news. So, briefly taken in by pure compassion, only to be overthrown, thwarted, and intoxicated with complete self-regard and a narcissistic bid for success, Victor blurted out, I'll help you, Dacian, whose face couldn't strike too many expressions with great accuracy, 
appeared undoubtedly confused. How? the hunchback asked. Why? Well, monsieur, I am a poet. Though the carver was definitely not uplifted by this news, he did his best to feign a look of gratitude before continuing with his work. For the next few weeks, Victor sponsored Dacian. He would visit him and his crew during the day, provide for them lunch, talk with them while they worked away. Instead of the cafe, he would pen poems in the Altilia. And it was this year of 1821 that his first book of poetry, inspired by the work ethic and style of the stonemasons, would be published. When the other workers were not around, when the night grew long, Victor would continue to visit and pass the time with Dacian. Their unlikely companionship grew. As the carver's creations multiplied with a perplexing dark beauty, Victor's spirits rose. He envisioned the papers advertising his book of poetry, how his critics would be dominated by the virtue of his overwhelming presence in defending the rich legacy of Notre Dame's original architecture. They would perceive him to be something of a knight, swatting away lesser cultures and artistic interpretations of the sake of more authentic visions. It was during this period that Dacian let Victor into the less explored details of his life. Details, he revealed, he would not share even with the other stonemasons that had grown accustomed to his mishap in form. The hunchback spoke of a woman, Esme, who operated a stand full of trinkets and relics. The hunchback collected them with what little he made and had a whole jewelry case full of Esme's false talismans. Each one represented a memory to him, but more importantly, a moment of courage, a second when he felt brave enough to speak to this person far more beautiful than he. What's more, Victor learned, Esme treated Dacian well. Whether this was due to the profuse funds which Dacian allocated monthly to gaining this shopkeeper's cordial affection and interactions, Victor was surely decided, but he didn't share his suspicions with the hunchback. You will tell no one, Dacian asked Victor. The hunchback dreaded the mockery that would be made of him should Parisian society become aware of his affections for Esme. Being so hideously deformed, he was something of a local talking point, and, and though few knew him by name, many had stories of the poor deformed stonemason who hobbled out of his dusty shop to collect the transient greetings of a talisman seller, what seemed to be one of the few sources of human affection he ever was graced with. Not a soul, monsieur, Victor assured him, not a soul. In the last two weeks before the carver's competition, Victor made a show of taking the hunchback out of his shop into the crisp early spring weather. He even briefly met Esme and analyzed the peculiar interaction that Dacian had with her. As the writer suspected, as soon as the exchange of worthless trinket and money was made, and the hunchback turned around grinning shyly to himself, the stand keeper's expression dropped, taking on the look a burlesque dancer might have after their tenth performance in a single night. Victor patted Dacian on the back, taking great pleasure in the attention his outings with the deformed mason were bringing him. His popularity as a poet was increasing, but with the oncoming success of Dacian's statues, he was certain his fame would be propelled to heights greater than Notre Dame's bell towers. On their stroll home that same day, Dacian revealed something else to the young writer. There was, of course, abuse lurking in the hunchback's history. Due to his requirement for measurements and context for the statues, the hunchback frequented the cathedral. He, too, was ambitious and seeking recognition. Like a poet seeking inspiration, Dacian examined every crevice and corner of the cathedral that he could. Though it caused his back insurmountable pain, he worked his way up the hundreds of steps to the bell towers, examined the flying buttresses, the cracks in the stonework, the deep gray of its material. For having been so isolated, the hunchback's most loyal friend was the stone he worked with. It offered a contrivance of trust and vows of solemnity from its silence. There was one who took to his distaste for Dacian with a particular toxicity, a priest who worked in the cathedral, a man by the name of Father Fabian. Dacian described him as hideous on the inside, as he, the hunchback, was on the outside. Victor began with the stammering assurance that his friend didn't at all look hideous only to receive a look sour enough to silence him on the spot. 
On another day, the two visited the cathedral with high spirits. Dacion's team of sculptors were finished with their pieces, meeting their deadline of 30 pieces for the judge's panel that would take place the following morning. It was a Monday afternoon, so the pews were sparse with prayers, as there were many other places of worship throughout the city with far more beauty than the humble Notre Dame. Upon inducting themselves into its wide halls and speaking lowly about Dacion's work, a priest appeared, and no sooner had the man spotted the hunchback than did he start lashing out with both words and gestures alike, calling the stonemason all manner of foul words, the expanse of which Victor arched an eyebrow in respect to the priest's broad vernacular. With little to no consideration for Victor's presence, the priest continued to berate Dacion until it was simply too awkward to stand there for long. So the odd pair left, and on their return to the Altilia, Victor joked that the hunchback had given the priest high praise and character in comparison to the vitriolic reality. Do you ever get used to it? Victor asked. Oh, words. The hunchback reflected. They, they aren't any harm. No, I mean the crowd. How they all listen to that foul priest setting fire to you. They've all seen it, Dacion said. They've seen it dozens of times, and they'll see it dozens more. The following morning... With the three crews of stonemasons standing beside their work, the judges announced whose work would be selected, and more importantly, who would oversee the stylistic development of the Notre Dame's cathedral's renovation. It was a man by the name of Henry Sibson, a name which, after Victor checked in with his sanity several times, was not Dacion's. No, it was not the name that would cart his poetry to esteemed critics, it, not the name that would cast his oncoming years of toil into fame. No, it was... Not the hunchback at all. It was difficult to say who took the news harder. Back at the workshop, the young writer flew into a rage, demanding the dumbfounded stonemasons what could be done to turn the tides of fate. There was, of course, nothing to be done. Callous to abuse, failure, and every manner of disappointment, Dacion had little to say. He, along with the others, would simply have to look elsewhere for employment. If they were humble enough, they would request to join Sibson's team, as they would need as many sculptures as they could get for the massive undertaking, what would take decades to complete. The workers still needed a salary. After all, they couldn't live off the compensation that the city had paid them for the months of drafting up styles for judging. That night, Victor drank and schemed. His thoughts burned a white rage at the indignance of society, the callousness required of a poet facing failure, of the injustice of it all. Poverty, work the pursuit of success and the dark consequences of failing to grasp it despite all his bloodied efforts. Oh, woe was him. But before he fell asleep that night, dizzy with frustration, a quiet smile found his lips. It was accompanied by a plan, a scheme. Had he not been awake for just that moment, it might not have visited him at all. Then he was promptly and soundly asleep. The following afternoon, Victor pulled Dacion out of his workshop with a beaming composure. The hunchback obliged the rider. The two went out for lunch. They discussed future prospects. At every possibility and detail, the rider simply nodded and expressed his absolute optimism for the hunchback's future. When asked about his particularly sunny disposition, Victor passed it off with the remarkable weather. What had drawn out throngs and throngs of people in the marketplaces that day. The pair found themselves strolling down a similar path towards the marketplaces beside the cathedral. It was here that Victor's countenance took on a methodical stoniness. His answers became abrupt. He remarked a little to Dacion. Then, without so much as a warning, he left the hunchback to his own devices and disappeared into the crowd with long, swift strides. Dacion tried to keep up with him, but the chaos of the marketplace seemed intent on stamping over him. By the time the poor hunchback had bound Victor, the young writer was laughing with Esme at her stand. Then, following a gesture, the hunchback followed them as they left the stand to Esme's brother. The two, just steps ahead of Dacian, were going towards the cathedral. Even on a day like today, the inside was vacant compared to the marketplace, and with the cover of the crowd, the trio slipped by unnoticed before being taken in by the heights of the monumental ceilings within. When Dacian finally squeezed in a question as to what they were doing, 
Victor just smiled and said, Taking a walk, Monsieur. Esme, too, was just as content and happy with a bizarre occurrence. Before long, the three of them attracted the attention of Father Fabian, who descended on them like a haggard crow having found a beetle to defend his forlorn nest from. Ignore him, Victor advised Dacian and Esme as they continued to the far back of the cathedral, embarking without hesitation up the steps. The longer they climbed the steps, the more Esme's enthusiasm dwindled. Though the relic vendor had no words, Dacian began to feel something horrendously particular about this situation. Perhaps the young writer, burdened by the stress of supporting himself and his fiance on a poet's salary, had finally snapped. For no matter what Father Fabian said, no matter what vile curses and oaths he spewed out, he just continued walking up the cathedral steps, an innocent grin and a quiet peace perfectly affixed to his cheeks. Esme gave some feeble remarks to fend off the harassment of the priest, though gave up as Victor continued to assure the two of them that there was nothing to worry about. Now on the roof of the cathedral, Victor shut the door behind him after the father, Fabienne, who had nothing better to do than verbally assault strangers and continued to stick to their directory without fail or consideration for the surroundings. Ah, Victor sighed. A gorgeous day, he said, more to himself than anyone. I don't understand, Esme said. What are we doing here? What have you paid me for? Paid her? You paid her, Dacian blurted out. This, all this was shouted over the ceaseless verbal pummeling of Father Fabian, who seemed to be making an attempt to match every prayer he'd ever thought, uttered, or pronounced with a curse of equal power. He was doing a fine job of riding the scales. The wind at the cathedral's roof was more chaotic than on the ground. It tore at them. Their voices raised, and the confusion spiked. There was an audible moment when all the actions without explanation resulted in a panic, where all four of them were shouting at one another. Victor, with false explanations, and the other three, with their erratic attempts to find some sense in what was happening. Then Victor produced a knife. Having already positioned himself to block the only exit, the panic which had possessed the three of them evaporated with the realization that they were trapped at a perilous height with what appeared to be a madman, his two eyes doing an enviable job of looking at the three people at once. He licked his lips with a nervous laugh. Victor, Victor, my friend, what are you doing? Nation asked him. Take it. Take it, Victor said, extending the dagger handle first to the hunchback. And do with it what you always fantasized about doing. Go on, he shouted. You don't need me to convince you. End this snarling whelp and avenge yourself for all the misery and embarrassment he's caused you. At that, Father Fabian fell to his knees. Victor's grin curled into a smile. That's right, he encouraged. Think of it. The injustice of it all. Esme let out a small scream, which Victor quickly silenced with a look that drained the blood from her lips. The hunchback approached the kneeling priest, his scarred hands wrapped around the handle of the blade. His knuckles paled, his face contorted, the resentment was palpable, it swelled and contorted his features. Then the blade dropped from his hand. As it glided to the ground, Victor snarled, What are you doing, you little monster? Monster, Dacian gasped. You, you. Victor lunged for the dagger, striking first at Esme. The tender flesh of her neck seemed to erupt from the devastating arc that swept across it. As she was falling, with Dacian rushing to push his hands against the gushing wound, Victor fell next upon the priest, and he made ribbons of his chest. His screams rose up as his heart was torn open. Behind them, Dacian wept over the low gurgling of Esme as she faded in his arms, covering the hunchback in her blood. Careful not to dirty his sleeves, Victor pushed away the priest, and Dacian looked up. There were no words to express the chaos of confused thoughts. There was all that was left that final moment, where Victor stood over him and, minding the blood that was pooling dangerously close to his shoes, the young rider stripped himself of his shirt and waistcoat, hands shaking with adrenaline. The hunchback wept a slew of questions and curses at Victor as he folded his shirt and waistcoat neatly almost calmly, and set it somewhere where it wouldn't be stained. Then he charged at the final action, the final cog in his scheme. Victor buried the knife in Dacian's heart. As the carver looked up at him with a profound sorrow, perhaps too deep for the pain he was feeling, Victor told him, And I promise, you will tell no one. After the hunchback's body had grown cold, 
he placed the dagger last in Father Fabian's chest. And after dressing himself in his clean shirt and waistcoat and forcing out tears from his face, he prepared himself for the last, perhaps most challenging event awaiting him that day. He would have to run out from the cathedral with every ounce of sincerity he could muster, proclaiming to the crowds the murderous priests he just narrowly dodged and the horrors he'd witnessed of his poor friend, the stonemason, being murdered, the hunchback of Notre Dame. When the story hit the presses of the double murder committed by Father Fabian, the committee in charge of the renovation of the cathedral decided that, with the support of Victor Hugo, who would be writing a tale to honor his friend and the city at large, it would be best to replace Henry Simpson's style with that of Dacion's. With the city in support of the poor carver who had been made victim by a deranged priest, there was no better press and no better way to gain financial assistance for the undertaking than on the back of a murder, and there would be, as it turned out, a writer whose tale would hold an excess of descriptions pertaining to the beautiful architecture of the Notre Dame Cathedral, for which the rest of his career would erupt into unheard heights. Welcome to the second segment of the episode. As you can probably tell, this story got a little bit away from me. Um, did the murderous Victor Hugo give it away? Victor Hugo's, you know, villainy, that was, of course, not taken from history. However, his work, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, did include a profuse amount of descriptions pertaining to the architecture of the cathedral, and is often criticized for doing so. And during the setting of this story, he was deeply passionate about maintaining the cathedral's gothic style. What I struggled to find from my research was why. It didn't seem obvious why Victor was so moved by a cathedral's architecture so as to write a novel surrounding it. He was politically active and did a tremendous amount of work ensuring the cathedral would be fitted with architects looking to maintain a more complex and culturally dark medieval look. And though it wasn't as it was in the story, a competition or a bidding, uh, there was some kind of tug and pull for which architect would lead the renovation. Now, although I'm assuming this isn't general knowledge, there is something even more fascinating about this bizarre tale. The archivist by the name of Andri Adrian Glue, excuse me, who works on the Tate Archives in London, was studying the handwritten autobiography of a 19th century British sculptor by the name of Henry Simpson. Henry Simpson was the character who represented the rival team of sculptors, which was utter nonsense, by the way, uh, who competed against Dacian. And if you didn't catch on by now, Dacian is basically Quasimodo. But Simpson was a real sculptor, a real stonemason. He'd even worked for a brief period on the renovation of the cathedral in the 1820s. What's fascinating is that this sculptor's accounts provide a deeply illustrated depiction of the artistic and social life of the sculptor in 19th century England. Simpson himself was not well known for a long time. He was a skilled outsider seeking recognition, which makes his autobiography very valuable. Here's the big kicker. I didn't just lump Victor Hugo and sculptors into a story because Victor was inspired by the architecture. Not so. You see, thanks to Simpson's lengthy autobiography, we know that during the 1820s, during the time that Victor was working on the novel The Hunchback of Notre Dame, that first novel of his that would gain recognition, he lived in the same area as the sculptors assigned to the cathedral's renovation, the 6th arrondissement. The writings reveal that the carvers were described as working in an altilier located nearby. More importantly, the Almanac de Paris from 1833 lists all professional inhabitants in the area. This includes one carver by the name of, oh, I'm going to butcher this, Trajan, who Simpson briefly worked for. My, uh, my big boy T here was contracted under a government sculptor. And this is a direct quote from Simpson's autobiography. Now, I forgot his name, as I had no intercourse with him. All that I knew was that he was humpbacked and he did not like to mix with other carvers. So, there you have it, the hunchback. It is later revealed in the autobiography that Simpson worked with the humpbacked carver, and during this time, it is speculated that due to the proximity of their workers and their shop, Victor might have taken inspiration from spotting the humpbacked craftsman. 
Of course, the story of Victor killing off the sculptor, his love, and the priest was more so in honor and taken directly from Victor's novel than the history behind it. I did this because I was perplexed by this idea that a writer of his age, mid-twenties, had such large concern for the architecture of a cathedral, and I was somewhat wondering if this was a bid for attention or success, much in the same way that writers today try to get articles and stories on topics related to current events, hoping that with a wider audience interested in learning about relative events, there are some scraps of prestige or success awaiting them. All right, that just about does it. Lastly, I need to thank Curious Fire and Windswept for providing soundtracks. You can find them across social media platforms. They are choice individuals, and I owe them a great deal for enhancing this show the way they do. Any other appearances by other musicians are appropriately credited, credited in descriptions found below this story. If you have been enjoying the show, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. Mania is entirely self-funded, running on the souls of exercised demons in consistent faith and hope for more coming. A subscriber-funded cup of coffee really goes a long way, especially if you know how many of those I drink. Otherwise, you can share this podcast with your friends or talk about it on your own social media. That is also gigantic. So, thank you very much for listening. And that just about wraps up this very long and strange episode. So, until next time, I do very much look forward to you joining me. Thank you for listening once again.